accept the reality that mankind is divided to two big groups, the dumb and the dumber. And both of them think they're geniuses. And both of them think they're godlike. And this inability is in itself, this inability of mine to accept reality is in itself profound stupidity. I'm one of you in this sense. The problem is, we have let the stupid and the weak take over the world. So the stupid, the dumb, the trivial, the brain dead, the frivolous are everywhere. Internet search engines rank results not according to the merits, authority and quality of the content. No! But by the number of votes and who cast these votes? You guessed it. Dense people, thick-headed people with skull and nothing in it who now congregate on social networks. This widespread and much lauded vandalism, because there's no other word for it, it's a destruction, the destruction of civilization, stone by stone. This reflects the utter collapse, utter disintegration of the education system. So our education system turns out illiterate, self-entitled, magical thinking, nation, nation and irrational graduates having annihilated its standards in order to lucratively embrace them as students in the first place. Money. Money talks. Education walks. This albeit brief essay on the lost art form of reading is in reaction to the growing functional illiteracy of not just the youth of today, but also the general population. Essentially, nobody is fucking reading anymore. And without holding my breath for the slightest of seconds, I'd like to theorize as to why and what, if indeed anything, we can do about it. The aim, however, is not to tell you that you must start reading immediately, but to perhaps ease you back into a pastime that is in danger of becoming obsolete due to the supposed technological advances of our times. And listen, I get it. I, GC Mackay, sympathise. I understand that in comparison to the mountainous shit heap of vacuous, brain-dead distractions available to us at the push of a button nowadays, reading can come across as, well, dull, mundane, monotonous, of a banal, boring pastime of old, and not appealing in the least. That's because it doesn't flash. It doesn't recognise your face. It doesn't do all the thinking for you. Ergo, it cannot appeal to the mindset of an addict. Yes, an addict. For that is exactly what you've been conditioned to behave like. A crack whore of your own algorithmic stupidity. And not just an addict, but an infantile one at that. A child junkie, endlessly chasing the dragon of your own mindlessness. The only way a book can guide you into the realm of another world is through the distinct effort on your part. Reading requires your participation. It is an active pastime. Compared to other, and I begrudge calling it this, but never mind, entertainments, reading is sterile because other diversions require nothing of you except your passive engagement. A book can't be flicked on and read in the background. You actually have to, God forbid, concentrate. And yes, 
I am aware that computer games are also similar in this regard, but their worlds have already been constructed for you. Imaginatively speaking, they are just as guilty and bereft as all the other entertainments out there. And if the words I'm using go beyond your weak, low-level vocabulary, try leveling up every now and again. Your relationship with your phone is not even a relationship with a device. It is one only ever with yourself. And these devices encourage, along with their flashy apps and nudging notifications, to only ever relate things back to yourself, diminishing your ability to see beyond the self-perpetuating merry-go-round of repetitive nostalgia and self-limiting narcissism. This is a nightmare. And Cuckerberg and Co deliberately and intentionally condition this into your behavior, into what is essentially, and I repeat for emphasis since you've likely no attention span whatsoever, the mindset of a child with the emotional maturity of a retarded hyena. And a spoiled one at that. A book does not offer any of this. That's first and foremost why I've had a number of people come onto this channel and comment that they not only do not have the time to read, but also when they have made the time specifically, they struggle immensely with the words glaring back at them on the bog standard piece of paper. The former, of course, is a lie, though to say that social media is stealing your time instead of you having dominion over it yourself would not be a far stretch from the truth. But there is courage to be found in such confessions, and even I, as someone who reads and writes voluminously, for reasons that he can no longer fathom, can indeed relate. It doesn't take a long time for your smartphone to essentially brainwash and render your mind unable to handle such bland stimuli in comparison. A book isn't going to tweet, it isn't going to bakaki you with hearts every time you complete a paragraph. It won't pop into your network and stroke you with contrived motivational quotes for every page you manage to turn. It isn't going to set up a round of neurological fireworks in a simultaneous cataclysm of serotonin and dopamine for every chapter completed. It will not scroll and spin and flash and suck you into its vacuum of superficiality, zombifying you into what essentially is a fruit machine addict mining for nuggets you know are simply not there, yet, for some reason, you just can't seem to stop spinning. But, instead of allowing myself further indulgence of this bitter diatribe, let me ask you a question. Did you know? that during the time of black and white television, people reported to dream in black and white. If a screen, even one as weak and limited as the televisions of old, can render the images of your subconscious monochrome, what else do you imagine they could do? Additionally, have you ever noticed that when a TV screen is in the room, say inside a bar, a salon, airport, train station, wherever, that your eye is immediately drawn to it, regardless of volume or of it being on mute. Even if the conversation you could be having with a friend has what you consider your full attention, if there is a TV behind the person you're speaking to, it'll still distract you in one way or another. This happens to be entirely out of your control. The phenomenon dates back to our time in the savannah, where our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have to be on the lookout for any sudden changes. For if the sway of the blades of grass jerk in a manner out of the ordinary, an imminent threat to our very survival could be only mere seconds away. <laughs> Of course, it wasn't always necessarily the case, but over hundreds of thousands of years, where dangers lurked everywhere from plant life to animal, 
it has become instinctual for us to automatically gaze at stimuli that flickers and flashes. For effectively, deep down in our lizard-brained core, we're anticipating something to jump out at us at any given moment. If we don't keep our eye on it, we feel a sense of betraying part of ourselves in the process. Naturally though, this serves to work against us in the modern world. Or at least, so it seems. We've been bombarded by screens since television went mainstream, so phones are really nothing new. But now, if you let it take charge, there's simply just no respite. It constantly wants your engagement, so long as it's mindless, passive, doe-eyed and dumb. Just a long thousand yard stare for a war, it declares, from within your very own mind. Have you ever, for instance, felt the relief that comes with either losing your phone or it running out of battery? I know I certainly have. It's as if all the stresses it triggered without you even realising it finally get the chance to dissipate. Whilst light in its relief, like a feather duster swept across the webbed wires of your neurological network, it genuinely clears the air and allows you room to breathe. For most of us are aware of what malware can do to our devices, but do we ever consider how our devices can make malware of our own minds? And this light relief, I implore you to take faith in, is exactly what reading can provide, should you have the guts to let it. So, just take a step back, feel your body exit the toxicity of cyberspace and all of its relentless trash, breathe and observe, look at it, it's so boring, so disgusting and basic, a basic bitch of entertainment. Only dorks read books. Books don't have muscles or titties. You can't see how many followers they've got, or subscribers, or likes. It's just a lonely, murdered tree full of black ink, reminding you of school by association. And since the education system can barely churn out people with decent reading abilities nowadays, there's even more reason to loathe it for its aesthetic. Books are dull as ditch water. But here's the thing. A book is only ever as dull as your imagination limits it into being. The reason you look at it with such contempt and aghast disappointment is that it too reflects the lack of imagination that you now possess. The imagination you inadvertently gave away for nothing but cheap thrills and hieroglyphic nothings. Pictograms symbolising empty never minds. It exposes you and the idiotic abuse you've put yourself through. For no other reason except to distract you from yourself. You fear it and dismiss it because it now works as a symbol for a skill you once had, but lost, due to your own sloth and indolence. It behooves me to concede, however, that much of this was out of your hands from the very beginning. We humans are natural seekers of comfort and security. Not only do we resist change and actively avoid it in what we think is our own decision-making, it is actually the brain's natural response 
to anything new. Something new is reflective of something unknown, and something unknown, by nature's design, is to be feared, unobserved, and avoided. And words are no exception to this. In fact, perhaps in some ways they should be feared the most. Just look at the destruction and chaos and inhumane acts that have been carried out because of some scriptures, for example. To blame it on words themselves is the mark of a fool, though. An excuse for human stupidity and lack of guile. Yet still, words do indeed contain a power to not only alter, but completely reconfigure your entire value system. Books indeed should be feared for this very reason alone, and are thus a symbol within themselves of our irrational ways of our propensity towards violence, of our temptation to annihilate all that surrounds us. They contain the same capability to separate us from one another as they do unite. But the scariest thing is that it all depends entirely on your interpretation. Perspective, you see, is somewhat of a bitch. I shall now attempt to offer some advice that may or may not be helpful, depending on whether you're willing to put in the effort, which probably isn't very likely. The first would be to revert back to a book that you once loved, presuming you've ever read one. Since nostalgia rules the roost of all things media and nothing new is made anymore, it makes logical sense to me that when rejecting modernity, even if only for, say, 10 minutes a day at first, you may be able to ease your mind's natural reluctance by rereading something you once loved. Again, assuming you've ever read anything at all. At the beginning, the malware I previously mentioned that dwells within your mind nowadays will put up resistance regardless, a firewall, if you will, but through the comfort of the familiar via association, you should be able to counter the initial discomfort you'll feel and remember, reminisce and revert the nostalgia without the need of letting it go. You may even recall what it's like to have an imagination of your own again. Not the one the algorithms duped you into possessing or what Kuckerberg and co told you you could or could not have. Your imagination could and should only ever be as censored as you yourself decide for it to be. And it can be of your own again. You just have to nurture it for yourself. Before beginning this new pastime, however, think about creating a safe space for your reading. Not the artificial safe space social chlamydia once conjured up, but an actual place of comfort of your own design that you can begin to associate with this new pastime. This can be as simple as sitting on the floor of your room, to surrounding yourself with childlike things such as plushies, comfort blankets, Ugg boots, fluffy socks, bedding, you name it. Whatever it takes to make you feel as blessed, serene and tranquil as possible, get it done. Machiavelli always donned his robes when he went to write each evening. So why shouldn't you do something that is unique and special, if not slightly <laughs> ridiculous, for when you want to read? Personally, my safe space often includes a glass of something alcoholic, some ambience of rain or binaural beats, and a sofa or armchair. First things first, however, put the cancerous brain cell sucking leech known as your smartphone away. Preferably, for example, inside a drawer. Stick to the adage, out of sight, out of mind. Consider it your drawer of shame, like any junkie of integrity would do with his or her supply. Or, better still, stick it in the corner of the room like the petulant child it has rendered and continues to encourage you into being. Make a little dunce hat for it, if you wish, so it can think about what it's done whilst you aim to recuperate from the abuse it's inflicted. Once that's done, sit down and get comfortable. 
Pick up the book. Look at it. Observe. Think about it in terms of the mystical, if you must. You don't know what's inside it yet. It's a gift within itself at this stage. Sometimes you won't like what's inside. Sometimes you will. Other times, often the best, you'll love to hate what it contains. At this stage, all is a mystery, much like life and the universe itself. But let's face it, all we really know is that we know nothing, and that nothing encapsulates everything. That nothing is us. But I digress. Do not judge the cover, merely take in its initial impression. What thoughts does it provoke? Which feelings currently resonate? Does it frighten you? Intimidate? Enthrall? Intrigue? All of the above? Whilst allowing your mind to freely consider these impressions, flip through the pages. Would you look at that? It can make noises too. Get it nice and close to your ear. Let it whisper its sweet, enigmatic nothings. Afterwards, open it up at the centre and stick your nose right in there. Huff it up like the good little addict that you are. This is your new and much needed methadone. Think of all the potentialities it beholds. This too could very well brainwash you into believing a load of hocus pocus gobbledygook if that makes you feel any better. Once the tingles have dispersed from all five of your senses, you'll be ready to begin. Don't worry, the Mickey Mouse apocalypse of dumb will still be out there once you're finished with this minuscule task. You can go back to eating Tide Pods, vaping the bathwater of e-girls, or listening to the vacuous nonsense of self-labeled experts as soon as you've got through just five pages. That's right, Daddy GC Mackay is only asking for a mere five pages. Then you can happily relapse back into the matrix of the moronic with guilt-free aplomb. But guess what, boys? If reading still doesn't appeal to you, let Daddy Porn wash you instead. Reading makes girls wet. Didn't you know? And not just wet, but a little bit crazy too. That narrative builds up not only in their heads, but you know where as well. So if you want to know women rather than piss your time away watching them sleep like the pathetic army of simps you've become, pick up a fucking book. Daddy has no reason to lie to you. Why do you think he got into writing in the first place? For those of you feeling more courageous, or who happen to partially enjoy a healthy dose of masochism, I would suggest a book of relative simplicity, on the surface at least, and of the existential. Apologies for the big word. The reason for this is to counter the initial alien intrusion of the book and its foreign entry into your pinball machine of a mind. The dull, monotonous and banal aesthetic of the book is threatening and unappealing because that's what the horror of real life is like at its core. So we each need to indulge in the art form by coupling it with the most humanistic of writings available. It's for this reason that I would recommend the following three titles, starting with The Stranger by Albert Camus. Since you're going back into foreign territory, a land of the relatively unknown and unexplored in today's world, you are the stranger and can therefore immediately identify with the lead character and put yourself within the shoes of our first person outcast that is Merceau. Since he has also become an orphan from the very first line of the story, he is now alone in the universe, just like you. Since now, it is just you, alone in a room, with nothing but a book in your hand. If you struggle, struggle. If the words bore you, yawn. If you need to follow the words with your finger because it reminds you of the screen of your phone, follow the words with your fucking finger. Use a ruler to cover up the other words and follow it line by line if need be. Ignore the page number. Do not check to see when the chapter ends. Do not read the introduction if it's your first time reading the book. Suspend your expectations. Place blind faith in the author and trust that they know what they are doing. Be an active participating spectator and nothing more. And by all goddamn means, 
do not look up the opinions of others beforehand. If you really do not understand by the end of the book what it is that you've read, then check up on its cliff notes, if any such exist. Then read the reviews. You can obtain your fix of dumb with absurd ease these days via the platform of Goodreads, full of gifs and emojis and all your favourite flashy hieroglyphics if need be. I fear that even The Stranger, however, might be a little too much for the younger members of my audience, if any such exist, going by my material nowadays. So, with that in mind, the second book that I recommend is Nothing by Jan Teller. Since most folk aren't able to read above the level of a 12-year-old these days, this particular book will suit them down to the core, since it features a story about 13 and 14 year olds told from the perspective of a friendly and easily understood girl. It is a fable of the human condition and also told in the manner of a fairy tale, just to make things even easier for you. One day, after realising that life is utterly meaningless, Pierre Anthon decides to renounce everything, climbs up a plum tree, and declares that life is indeed without meaning. Pointless, in a word. His fellow schoolmates, although at first partially amused, later become concerned, then conspire in order to get Pierre Anthon down from that damn tree. But he's having too much fun pelting them with plums and telling them that nothing they do will sway him from his realisation. Eventually, the kids come up with the heap of meaning and begin to place items of extreme personal significance to them onto the heap. But when each kid can't be trusted to place items of real significance to them, it becomes the decision of another instead where they begin to force each other to give up things they truly do not want to be without. If you haven't guessed it, things get pretty fucked up as the story goes on. Along the way, the actual difference between everything and nothing becomes more and more difficult to differentiate. The book provokes as much as it haunts, and you never know, it just might change your outlook on life as a whole. Because that is what literature is capable of doing, in case you didn't know. The third and final story isn't even a novel, but a short story. Step in Edgar Allan Poe and his piece, The Black Cat. <laughs> I've selected this story because of the endless uploads of cats across all your favourite platforms. However, this particular protagonist isn't all that enamoured with the feline members of his immediate family. I've even taken it upon myself to explain exactly how Poe came up with many of his horror stories, so there'll be even less thinking involved for you when it comes around to reading it. Number one, the main character, often without a name, will declare that, despite appearances and his frantic mood, is definitely 100% not insane. Number two, exposition of setting, situation, and how it all got started. Number three, shows off knowledge of ancient Greek mythology as MC, despite his earlier claims, begins to lose his mind. Number four, main character commits murder, still claiming he definitely 100% isn't shitback cuckoo. And number five, buries body of victim, either in the walls or under the floorboards, then gets caught by his own hubris, stupidity to you, rounding everything back to the beginning where he'll still claim he isn't Looney Tunes, even though it is pretty damn obvious that he is. So, there we have it, folks. I hope this video has been helpful to anyone out there who may still have an interest in reading, but hasn't quite realised why it is so difficult for them to get back into the page-turning groove. Of course, if your parents didn't give a hoot about your education and left you to your own devices, pun intended, during your earliest development years, it's likely that you'll always have difficulty with grammar and the like. In essence, you're fucked, so you better learn how to code, kid, and fast. For those of you not functionally illiterate, however, you may just find the information in this video to be beneficial. In the end, 
reading will sadly always be a niche form of entertainment and learning, but for those of us who are attuned to its secrets and true capabilities, it shall always stand without comparison. Thank you. Class dismissed. Humanity is under imminent threat of being overrun by idiots, diluted by imbeciles, and submerged by a tidal wave of retardation. Just have a look at YouTube comments.